To introduce Willie, I would like to bring to the stage Mr. Tom Jensen. There are a lot of corporations, people around the world who are piling in to provide money, serious money, resources, access to scale what you will see that Willie and his team have done in Borneo to take that methodology around the world. So I'd love for Tom to come out for two minutes and introduce Willie and why Systemic, his company, is so involved. Tom Jensen. I'm probably going to be the shortest speaker here today, and I'll tell you a little story uh, why I think that's a very bad thing. It's got to do with my family, which is kind of a special situation for me, because my s I'm Norwegian, if you, and uh, I'm brought up in a, a very egalitarian society, and I have two sisters. The older one is the Minister of Finance in Norway, and the younger one is head of WWF in the same country. So you can imagine when we're sitting around the table discussing uh, the challenges facing humanity uh, is quite an interesting discussion, and that's why I'm a little bit, um, I, I kind of need to, to take the stage and, and try to get some attention as well, because these obviously, <laughs> obviously do. So, so I have a background from energy and energy intensive business for about 20 years, and then I took a radical choice to start in agriculture, a startup company that produces microbes and use microbes to break down waste streams into valuable products. And I crossed the valley of death, and we raised a lot of dollars, and I did all the mistakes in the world when you run a startup. So I learned a lot. But I had to leave that company because I wasn't able to deliver the returns that were expected in the company. And I had my wake-up moment. I found myself walking around in Schiphol, which most people on this environmental journey probably travel more than most people and leave behind a uh, footprint uh, higher than most. But I found myself asking myself, what the hell do I tell my children 20 years from now when they ask me, did you know? And that's what really made me think that we need to do better. We can do better. And it is all around us. The answers are all around us. It is not a lack of technology. It's not a lack of solution. It's not a lack of understanding of the problem. It's a lack of a sense of urgency, and it's a lack of doing. We cannot change climate change if we don't understand how and where we need to implement these solutions. Today we're at 408 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's growing at its highest rate ever. So it's not going down. And how will it go down? The only way to take CO2 out of the atmosphere that we know of is through more biomass. So we are moving into a biomass economy. That's what we need to do to extract CO2 from the air. Now, I had, and, and to do that, to plant and reforest deforested land, which amounts to millions, if not billions of hectares around the world, we need to fix Indonesia. Because Indonesia, is such an important area for deforestation, so it needs to be fixed. So I had the blessing of being introduced to the next speaker, Mr. Willie Smits, who I now am proud to say is a, is a good friend of mine. And he is probably the person on the planet that understands nature best. And he has developed something that is truly remarkable. And it's a scalable system for re-establishing solid, profitable, social, environmental systems. And he is a guy who took Einstein seriously. Because Einstein told us, look deep into nature, and you'll find all the answers you need. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a guy who has gone deepest into nature, Mr. Willie Smits. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Tom. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to tell you a little bit of my journey over the last 38 years, trying to understand what nature is doing and how we can put that to good use. So I've always said nature knows best, and I want to go back to nature's lessons. 
If we look at the title, Change, well, we are changing so many things right now. We've heard already from Amy uh, what we are doing to the Earth, moving more of the material on the surface of the Earth and all natural processes together, losing biodiversity, uh, our future capital, at such a speed that it is beyond belief and that we actually shall never breathe again air with less than 400 ppm CO2, something that hasn't happened for so long. We are truly eating into the resources of our Earth. And these are some of the images in my country, Indonesia, where we are truly causing huge trouble for the whole world. We were for a long time the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases worldwide. And doing that with a country which has almost no industrial pollution whatsoever, completely from the environmental destruction. We have peat swamps that contain huge amounts of carbon which are being converted to oil palm plantations to feed the needs of many Western countries. And we all know what is going on. The population is shooting up, CO2 levels are shooting up, extinction. What we don't know is where is going to be the boundary where we're going to cross it, because we are crossing it. When I came to Indonesia in 1980 for the first time, I have still encountered a beautiful country with a vast area of tropical rainforest. I was driving on the East Coast and I had to drive for hours and only saw jungle along it. But now that very same route almost everywhere looks like this. We have now 28 million hectares of this land, just grass, all the nutrients lost, flushed into the sea, killing off oceans, the coral reefs there, the breeding grounds of fish, taking away jobs. And that area is still increasing. The deforestation in the island where I've been working for so many years is just beyond belief so fast. The data are all there. So why aren't we making better use of it? Because there are better uses. Change is natural. Yeah? We humans have developed over time. And nature will always find a way to survive. There are these extremophiles, like the bacteria, like these worms that can grow in high temperature, the tardigrades that can survive the vacuum of space and radiation. Life will be OK, but not as humans. If we want to stay part of this ecosystem of the world, then we better learn and be part of nature and not try to control it. When I was here at the first day at this agricultural innovations, it was really scary for me because it was more of the same, more tools, less jobs, greater inequality, more fertilizer. We're running out of fertilizers in 10 years. The price of fertilizer has gone up three times. In 20 years, there won't be any more phosphate. We already have huge issues with nitrogen. So really, the resources are running out. These processes of tipping points, self-enhancing cycles that are speeding up everything that is happening, what Malthus already predicted several hundred years ago and is now coming back in all these publications, Club of Rome, and now what we are looking at, the nine planetary boundaries. Some of them haven't been cal calculated yet, but we all know what water and energy and all the problems are doing. And this is already causing huge impacts in the world. The water, the fertilizer, energy, the food, and we already have conflicts based upon these disturbances that we are creating. So we are actually gambling with our future. This is not in line with a precautionary principle. So if we look at the experiences, and that right now, almost 80% of all the energy is coming from just a few crops with a very limited genetic basis, and we seem to have forgotten the lessons of the past. There was this thing called the Irish uh, um, potato famine, where millions of people died because of one fungus attacking all of those potatoes there, and millions of Irish people migrated to the United States. And a lot of people don't realize, but there was just a few plants of this one species of rice that had to protect all the rest of the rice. 60% of the world population almost lost their most important source of carbohydrates. 
without this one little species that provided its gene to save the mankind, we would have lost it. And now we're seeing everywhere the same problems coming. The Cavendish bananas that were established as the only surviving species of those fungi are now also threatened by a new form of Panama disease. So it is continuing. What is happening is that climate uh, change is shifting the climate zones at a speed that trees cannot follow in the migration. So they will not have the optimal growing conditions to which they were adapted over thousands, over ten thousands of years. So they now become predisposed to many more pests and diseases. You already see it here in the United States. You have here you lost almost all your American chestnuts. You have the Asian longhorn beetle, the huge millions of hectares of forest dying off as a result of bark beetles being able to migrate into zones where trees no longer have that uh, good resistance against the problem. So where do we look at for the future? The future is at the equator. That is the area where the climate will change least. That is where we still have this very huge biodiversity which is part of the stability of ecosystems. That's where we have most of the solar radiation and year-round growth and rainfall. And there we also still have the land where we can make a very big change. That is where we need to find the solutions in the forests where my friends, the orangutans, are living, which can also bring you a future in terms of money. So what I try to do from the desperation of seeing all those trees, all those plants and animals losing their habitat, trying to come up with solutions that truly can be triple P, that can help people, that can help the economy, that can be sustainable for the environment and the biodiversity maintained in it. So the, sorry, what I do is I try to learn from nature and nature has very great systems how to recover from disturbances because it can come for even in places where nothing is growing, they bring up trees with their deep roots bring up minerals and water from the soil to the surface, combine it with the energy of the sun and through microorganisms we can build up this biomass that can then start providing us with all the needs of the people, water, food, materials. And those forests are actually already in existence, they are already planted by people in Indonesia. And they are not just drawings, they are actually there. These are mixed forests that in total produce more than any form of monoculture can ever achieve. Because you capture all the light and there's year round the conversion of that sunlight into products that have a great value. And one of the key species that I'm using in this system, can we switch off the sound of the video, thank you is the sugar palm. The sugar palm is a unique tree. It has a special kind of photosynthesis to be more productive. And what you do is you use this flower stem and you slice off a millimeter every day of that stem and then it starts dripping juice, sugary juice. You see those fruits behind that dripping cut-off stem? The trick is the tree will only live as long as it needs to reproduce. Once that is achieved, then it will die. So what we are doing is stealing the sugar from that tree, which is based, uh, coming out of the leaves, and 30 minutes later is coming out of that bleeding surface so that the sugar doesn't go to the seeds, the tree doesn't ripe, the tree continues to hang on to life and produce sugar. So with this, this one tree can produce about three kilograms of sugar, so two liters of fuel for your cars every day from a single tree. This is a productivity many times higher than any sugar cane. The highest ever was 18 tons per hectare in Cali with all the irrigation and the fertilizer in Colombia will ever be able to achieve. So the sugar palm has roots that go deep. It has a, myri a myriad range of adaptations to make good use of the sunlight and of the growth and putting away organic material deep in the soil, making the soil better, storing carbon and water retention. And there are 65 different products that you can harvest from it. And this sugar palm can thereby give a total package in a mixed forest that doesn't grow in monoculture where you have food security. One hectare of forest could provide a village of 500 people seven months with the calories they need to survive in case everything else would have gone wrong. 
So we also have the CO2 effects with a huge amount of replacement of fossil fuels through the biofuels that you can create. If you would make sugar into uh, other products, it costs the tree seven times more energy. And then we are harvesting energy back like from oil palms. Actually, if you could harvest the sugar, shortcut it, you had seven times more energy. So there are jobs in it. Anything that oil palms, which are in my country right now, by me considered to be one of the most destructive forces on the planet, sugar palms can do better. If you have sugar, you have the world. Sugar is a form of storable energy. It's a chemical battery that preserves that solar energy and you can transport it easily and convert it to any kind of product that you need. So the sugar palm for me is truly the champion of photosynthesis, food security, environmental protection, income, job creation, climate protection, jobs, etc. Now I want to tell you a little bit about another breakthrough that has just been realized for the last five years. One factory succeeded where 20 other big government proce uh, sponsored processes failed, and that is the torrefaction. It is a kind of roasting of biomass and making it into a clean coal, a coal product that can directly be replaced. So you don't need any capex, you don't need any other special methodologies to implement this product. So we created like a bridge between the biomass in nature and anything that you can derive today from fossil fuels. So what do we do in these degraded forests of which we have 88 million hectares? They're no longer growing, 15 years old, they're weed species, they're dying off, emitting actually greenhouse gases. We go into those forests and we take the dead wood and we turn that into a something that is called biochar. I'm going to come back what biochar is. And then we take out all the trees, these shrub trees, these weed species, which still have a lot of biomass, and we take the chips. The wood contains very few nutrients, but all the leaves and the bark and the twigs we leave in that forest to protect the forest floor and to maintain the nutrients in the system, like you're doing also in Colombia now. And the wood chips are then taken towards the torrefaction factory. In a torrefaction factory, we can use some of the energy in that woody biomass to make a much denser form of uh, material, which is called this biocoal, the torrefaction pellets. From the system, we can also generate electricity and heat, and we can feed it back into other systems. But the best thing is there is a way to gasify this cleaner biocoal coal, into syngas. And that syngas can then be used to make anything that comes out of fossil fuel. And as a side product, we produce vast amounts of biochar that you can now store into the soil. Biochar is this material, basically a kind of charcoal, but at a very high temperature, so it's chemically more stable, and you can put it for thousands of years in the soil. And it then enhances the microbes, it raises the pH and the nutrient availability, the water retention capacity of the soil. It does all kinds of good stuff for plants. As you can see here, the cassava, if you look underground, has a hugely higher productivity on those poor soils in the tropics when you apply the biochar. And here's with cassava, we've done this with many, many different plant species. So you can see that the biochar outperforms other fertilizers by far. And you can even, from the smoke in the process of making that biochar, get tar that you can use to preserve wood, so you don't need to go into the remaining good forest to take out valuable timber to uh, use that for house building. You can now use cheaper material. The wood vinegar from the smoke is a replacement for Roundup glyphosate, which is now becoming very clear, a huge environmental problem and health hazard for many people around the world. So those are some of the technologies, but what is at least as important, which we also discussed at the very first day in the meeting here, is what is happening to those people. People don't want to be in farms anymore. They all want to go to the cities. And we should provide them with designs where the people that are actually doing the jobs in the field can be happy. So we have uh, a long culture in Indonesia of tea plantations, and you have to give the people their things, including internet and karaoke, or the religious and the cultural facilities. If you do that, it becomes more valuable for people to stay in that location. So 
how are we going to put all these things together? I'd like to show you that now. This was an important publication. It showed that the biggest CO2 emissions worldwide are caused by deforestation of tropical rainforests. But it also shows that the biggest opportunity to fix the problems is replanting those forests. And we have a lot of land in need of reforestation. So what about combining, restoring forests, putting carbon into the soil, providing replacement fuels for the world's energy, saving biodiversity? I have no time to go into the details how that works, but we can preserve a lot of that biodiversity and creating jobs and food security through this program we call Rebuild. We have now set up a joint venture, which is combining these technologies of torrefaction and the huge potential of the tropics to provide this vast amounts of biomass, even from those critical soils. And we are doing that in the East Kalimantan, that is the first pilot area. How do we do it? In classical forestry, what you see is people make pulp and paper plantations, very short rotations, then harvest. You run into problems with nutrients in the long term. If you do the system that we have for managing natural forests in Indonesia, you have to wait 35 years before you can come back. Guess what? Corruption, wood thieves, anything, fires, it doesn't last. So what I try to do is come up with mixed recipes where you have some kind of product at any time in that cycle. So I won't go through these recipes, but basically we put in a mix of species that can over time fill up the space optimally, capture that light, keep the nutrients into the system, and where you can at any time arrange how many jobs are needed or how much food is needed, how can you adjust it to the market developments. And how can you get the income in the best way out? This is what it looks like. This is the type of forest, yeah, the degraded forest on the top left, where people thought there's no value in it. There's only these wheat species of low quality wood. And that's what we harvest and make into those torrefaction pellets. And then we plant something like cassava, for example, which grows very fast because there's all these roots decaying, all those nutrients becoming available, and the cassava can immediately start intercepting the light and turn it into products that the people need. But underneath that cassava are already growing the fruit trees and are already growing the sugar palms. And actually the cassava is suppressing the weeds, so it's actually cheaper to do it in this way. And when you harvest your cassava, you get an immediate return on your investment while you leave behind a very good forest, which is now continuing to grow up to a much higher biomass on that same area with a diversity on products that provide many times more jobs for people. So from a begin situation, from a degraded forest where we create biochar from the dead material, put it in the soil to increase the growth potential of that soil and where we can instantly provide a big, big boost of biomass in the form of torrefaction pellets and later syngas. We can go to food, we can then go to the sugar palms, we can then go to uh, high quality wood species. This is just one recipe out of a hundred. They are different depending upon the slope, the toil, soil type and the altitude, etc. Here is one example area where we did it on 5,000 acres on worse. This was land where only we had is, was this grassland. In year one, you're planting the trees. In year two, three, you can see that the crops like bananas and the papayas and the pineapples, they start providing some income, some jobs for the people. But it's not growing very fast. But now the trees start reaching those nutrients deeper in the soil because that's your real capital, the nutrients in your soil. And then you see that the round canopy starts closing up and that the clouds are coming back, the rainfall starts to increase and the nutrients bringing, brought up to the surface are growing a new forest, biodiverse, where many jobs and now over 160 species of birds are living, clouded leopards, the eagles, all the big predators are living again in just a small area of 5,000 acres. So what we try to do here is combining the power of nature and the power of technology. We are combining the energy of the sun and the CO2 from the air with the minerals and the um, the water from the soil into forest and the biomass converted into carbon that can be used by the world. And that most important one is syngas. It's a special process. It's not normal gasification. We can 
in this system recapture the minerals and put part of the carbon back in the soil. So here we combine the power of photosynthesis through uh, innovative reforestation models with new technology of torrefaction and gasification, combine it with a very old technique from the terra preta, from the Amazon forest, where we can permanently make soils more fertile while storing CO2 from the air. So what we are doing here is using this system to bring in energy from the sun to the world, but also to bring CO2 from the air into the soil. So the CO2, part of it is a replacement product for fossil fuels, part of it goes into the soil for thousands of years. So it's a system to remove CO2 from the air. But the most important one for me is the capital, it's the nutrients in the soil. If you can recycle those nutrients, you're not just recycling them, you're actually adding to the no total amount of nutrients in that ecosystem, which means that over time, the capability of that ecosystem to capture sunlight and to produce more usable energy is increasing. And this is all taking place without any artificial fertilizer or any of those pesticides. It is based upon biodiverse systems, not upon mono cultures where you have to help that species uh, to survive under the conditions. So this is what I think the power of nature to create also the jobs and the income for people. We've done it now on over a half million hectares. It's going to be over two million acres pretty soon. We were now building these facilities with Arsari. If we look at the worldwide opportunities, there's about two billion hectares of degraded land where we should be doing reforestation according to the World Resources Institute. And a lot of that land overlaps with uh, conditions that are beneficial and suitable for the systems that we have developed in Indonesia. So there, are a huge, there is a huge potential to scale up these systems. And the great thing for many people that uh, are asking is that the markets are already there. The Netherlands just wanted 3 million tons of these pellets. In Japan, they want 45 million tons. So there's actually an established market. And we had one of the world's largest accounting firms doing an analysis of it. And they came up with the result that, yes, this system is about twice as profitable as your oil palms. So that provides us with opportunities. So I tend to say there's still time. We still have a chance to clean up some of the mess that we have created. Thank you. Limitless. You started with orangutans. And if I want to protect orangutans, I have to figure out what to do about their habitat. And if I want to protect their habitat, I have to figure out how to help those human, those, those other apes, those hairless apes. And how do I get us hairless apes into the game? And then we found technology combined with the sun, which has been there for a while. And you put this, the concentric circles just kept getting bigger and bigger. Thank you. Thank you.